Welcome to the Play Podcast with me, Douglas Schatz. Hello, and welcome to episode 31 of the Play Podcast, where we explore the greatest new and classic plays. I'm Douglas Schatz, founder and host of the Play Podcast. The curtain rises on a barren landscape, a dry plain receding to the far distance. Center stage, a woman is buried up to her waist in a mound of scorched grass. She is sleeping, her arms on the ground before her and her head on her arms. Beside her lie a black shopping bag and a collapsed parasol. She lies in blazing sunlight. Behind the mound, a man lies on the ground, also asleep. A bell rings piercingly for about 10 seconds. The woman does not move. The bell rings again. She wakes. The bell stops. She raises her head, gazes front. She straightens up, lays her hands flat on the ground, throws back her head and gazes at the sky. Another heavenly day, she says brightly. This is the stark and shocking opening of Samuel Beckett's third great dramatic masterpiece, Happy Days. It is a scene that remains as striking and unsettling on stage today as when it was first performed exactly 60 years ago. Its central metaphor that we endure the empty routine of our daily existence through personal delusion and social ritual remains as universal as ever. In fact, the apocalyptic world and personal predicament portrayed in Happy Days feels very much like a play for our own time. The portrait of someone trapped in a seemingly endless daily routine speaks loudly to the monotony and isolation many of us have experienced stuck in life limited by the pandemic. Samuel Beckett established his reputation as the most innovative and challenging dramatist in the world in the 1950s with his first two plays, Waiting for Godot and Endgame. Happy Days, his third full-length play, premiered in New York in September 1961 and a year later at the Royal Court in London in November 1962. Critics were divided about the play's form, some suggesting that its static form was untheatrical while many acknowledge the hypnotic power of the language and the metaphoric resonances. Audiences were universally impressed by the tour de force performances in the demanding lead role of Winnie. The play is essentially an extended monologue that she delivers while physically trapped throughout in the mound. Peggy Ashcroft, who played Winnie at the National Theater in 1976, labeled the role a summit part on a par with Hamlet for a female actor and a number of fine and brave actors have scaled the part since. To mark the 60th anniversary of its first production, Irish actress and Beckett specialist Lisa Dwan has just finished a triumphant run as Winnie at the Riverside Studios in London in a new production directed by Trevor Nunn. It was a stunning performance, full of instinctive and intelligent understanding of Beckett's lyrical language and deeply moving in her portrayal of Winnie's defiant but vain struggle to keep despair and the encroaching earth at bay. Which makes me fantastically excited to be able to talk today with Lisa herself, who has kindly given up some of her well-deserved rest time after the run to share her enthusiasm for Beckett and this majestic play. I'm even more grateful because as we speak, Lisa is expecting her first child any day now. So congratulations on the play and your forthcoming arrival, Lisa. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much. Thank you. I must do a proper introduction to you, Lisa. Lisa Dwan is an award-winning actress, director, writer, and scholar. She's most well-known internationally for her performances and adaptation of Samuel Beckett's work, including multiple performances of Beckett's Not I over the past 15 years. Starting in 2013, Lisa toured the world with the Beckett trilogy, which comprised Not I, as well as two of Beckett's other short plays, Footfalls and Rockaby. In October 2016, Lisa adapted and starred in Nose Knife, a one-woman production adapted from Beckett's stories and text for nothing at London's Old Vic and the Abbey Theatre in Dublin. She has written and presented documentaries on Beckett on BBC and Sky Arts. She has lectured at Columbia, MIT, New York University, Oxford and Cambridge, and is currently a visiting professor at Princeton University and Cast Mellon, distinguished visiting artist at MIT. In case you think Lisa does only Beckett, she's also appeared on stage around the world in plays by Shakespeare, Pinter, and Wilde. And over the past two years, she's worked with writer Colm Toybean on his new version of Antigone, Pale Sister, 
which was broadcast on BBC this March. She also starred opposite James Nesbitt in the recent BBC TV drama, Bloodlands. So Lisa, given all your work on Beckett, my first question has to be, where did your special interest in Beckett begin and why is his work so important to you? Um, oh, thank you. And thank you, Douglas, for that introduction. Um, well, I first came across Beckett when I was 12 years of age. I had never been exposed to his works on stage, but I walked into our living room where Jack McGowan's face was taking up the entire screen. This haunted man's face being terrorized by a viper like relentless voice that of Sean Phillips and the voice a woman's voice seemed to be speaking to him from behind his eyes as the camera was edging closer and closer while this man sat alone in um, a cell-like room. And I may not have understood it at 12 years of age, but I never forgot it. And I was um, struck by Samuel Beckett then. And then when I became a professional actress. I was working with an actor called Stephen Brennan, who's a great Beckett actor. And he was involved in the Gate Theatre's productions with Channel 4, where they were committing all of Beckett's work to camera. And his director, Robin Lefebvre, asked me if I would work with them in doing the movement in the background while uh, Stephen was doing a piece of monologue that I would be the figure and because of my early career as a ballet dancer they felt that I had the kind of the rhythm and the sensitivity to work with the musicality of Beckett's language and there was a Beckett festival going on at the time along with all of these productions and so that was my bar and my benchmark when I came to theatre was Beckett and so I was drowned in his entire oeuvre and um, I'll never forget the moment when Stephen Brennan in 2000 on Baggett Street Bridge and our way to work described for me in detail Samuel Beckett's one woman monologue, Not I. And still to this day, you know, I've performed it all over the world, as you know, for years, but I've never seen an actual production of it. Huh. I only ever had the reference that Stephen Brennan painted on my imagination back in 2000 that totally captivated me. And I think something was set fire in my imagination. And to be honest, I've really realized that the thing that still stays ignited was Beckett's landscape, which is devoid of narrative and his creatures let's not call them characters because they're not really characters are liberated from narratives and therefore they can operate in a very metaphysical world and I find that to be a deeply luxurious and spoiling landscape to put my imagination in and I, 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 I can't get enough of it. That's uh, amazing because that landscape would seem daunting to many others I'm sure its bleakness and its emptiness. But it's also struck by the fact that you were originally attracted by the visual imagery on the screen and then by the language as well, because the plays seem to have these extraordinary visual uh, tableau that even just to start with, that puts you into that world that you've just described. I mean, Beckett is so much more of an installation artist. He's quite holistic in that regard. And I just find his images to be so reflective of a psychological state and, and, and a kind of global psychological state often that I find so all-encompassing and inviting. That's really well put because I think these landscapes or these installations, you describe them, they sort of, they eschew all the normal social trappings that comprise our external world or, you know, and certainly theater sets. And they, they somehow just speak straight to, as you said earlier, something metaphysical. It addresses our most profound existential doubts somehow, the question of whether there's any solid ground at the depth of our consciousness. It's all distilled, isn't it, to an elemental form that. I think Beckett, among many other things, was one of the greatest innovators in the theatre. And his marriage of his music and the imagery combined 
create an atmosphere where what I love about him is that there's no sermon. He's not preaching. There's no story. He's not slipping us a wink. He's not trying to sell us anything. As as um, Pinter says, he couldn't give a bollock whether we buy what he has or not. <laughs> He's simply putting his hand on the wound. And um, as a result, he's giving us permission and the scope and the place to find our own. And I feel there's a kind of communion that happens with Beckett's work and audience members, if they let it, yes. if they bring their intellect and their fear and their judgment, they'll have plenty to feed on, of course, but they won't get it. And I think that Beckett creates these, these humble spaces. And they're humble in the sense that Beckett was always pairing, you know, they're obviously extremely in-depth and uh, profound, but they're not um it's interesting in 1945 a sort of epiphany happened to Beckett in a way and this isn't an overnight thing but he was so heavily influenced by Joyce and other modernists at the time but he felt that you know Joyce was always adding to his work you only had to look at Joyce's proofs to see that And, you know, you need to have a a healthy knowledge of the Greeks and the Bible and classics and and plenty other references in history to access Joyce. And Joyce liked that. It tickles the intellect and he's extraordinary. But Beckett realized that his way was in the impoverishment, in the pairing back, in the subtracting rather than the adding. And his subjects became then the disenfranchised, the lonely, the helpless, the lost, the crones that walk the roads of Ireland, as he described the figure in Not I. And there's a universality to Beckett's creatures. That means that anyone can access them if they allow themselves. Yes. It's deeply, it's deeply human, honest work. Yes. As you say, paired back so that there's nothing intervening really between you and and this elemental challenge, existential challenges. But as a friend said to me once, you know, Beckett is a very cruel writer. It might be okay for him to describe the world that way, but the rest of us need our delusions. Aha. Yes. And I guess that's partly about what Happy Days is about as well with Winnie. But I want to come to that. Initially, I just want to ask you about the opening tableau i mean the tableau of the whole play where winnie is buried in the mound and that landscape which he's occupying do you i don't know whether you think about or do you think we are supposed to think about what's what is this landscape how did she get here all those sort of questions about what's going on or do we just push those to the side and accept what we see oh i have no prescription for any um for any audience member this is what you should be thinking People come to me every day and say, um, oh, it's about menopause or, oh, it's about death or, oh, it's about a woman halfway through her point in life or, oh, it's such a play for our times with COVID and confinement. The thing about a universal truth when you touch it is it's about all those things, if you wish. Yeah. You know, so people have scope to bring their own baggage. And, and even as a performer, the things that it would ignite in me would change daily. I was going to ask you how you felt, how it felt to be physically entrapped like that uh, as a person but and, and as an actor. So, Well, I'm quite used to that. It, it was less of an entrapment than, let's say, I've performed Not I, where my head is actually physically tied to a plank of wood and my arms are held in brackets and my whole body is pushed against a wooden board. That was... And it's certainly a lot more restrictive than sitting in a mound of earth. At least I had my hands free and I could see and I had props and I had a um, someone else on stage with me. So to me, it was it, it didn't feel like a major entrapment. The heat, obviously, just technically for any actress playing that role is a problem. But particularly when you're pregnant, you have to be very careful not to overheat. And under those piercing lights which they need to be the scorched earth that can be quite intense and you know it's it's an arduous ask it's essentially a two-hour monologue with about nine interruptions from Willie um but I'm also used to that too and 
I think I'm so overwhelmed by the privilege of being given a role like that. Like for any man to write a woman's role like that. Like I think Peggy Ashcroft would probably just being polite saying it's the female Hamlet. It's far harder than Hamlet. <laughs> and you know, I'm 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 not gonna complain about how hard it is because that's just part of the gift of being given that amount of space, a character so rich and nuanced and funny and tragic and defiant and brilliant and thoughtful and resourceful as Winnie. I, I, I don't know a single other female role that's as great as that. And I don't, I don't know who would write that today, you know? So often narratives, and I think this is what Beckett has shown me by introducing me to myself, by being liberated from narratives for so long, and performing his work for so long, liberated from narratives where I get to play like consciousness and not I. Um, and so many of his characters are so multifaceted creatures, let's say. They're, they're, they're just, there's so many kind of voices in one because Beckett was putting the mind on stage, you know, and, and the mind just doesn't have one kind of note. It's a whole cacophony of selves. And Beckett, you know, there's just so much going on about identity politics at the moment. Beckett and his metaphysics really demonstrate just how many selves there are in one and what a universe of selves we all are. And um, to get to, to really voice that and inhabit those expansive roles it was quite difficult then to return to just playing Pinter's whore and virtuous wife or Anna Karenina or all the other. And you start to examine what narratives do in our society and why we keep clinging back to these little bite-sized versions of identity of selves and perpetuate these notions of women that are so pithy and ridiculous. And so it's very spoiling. And I can't see any other writer who's writing roles that great for any human being, but particularly for a woman. But don't we, I mean, Winnie does certainly to some degree, but we make up stories about our identity, don't we? And, and we perform these rituals that give us some sense that there's a shape and a framework to what we are. And she, she um, demonstrates some of those to try and hold on to something, I guess. I was going to, actually, there's a quote you remind me of that Beckett said about the whole idea of Winnie's predicament initially. I don't know if that's exactly what she was doing, if you're referring to the Cooker story or the Mildred story. If anything, she's using imagination to tell a deeper truth. Yes. I just meant in, in her daily rituals of things, I suppose, which aren't very deep in terms of a narrative, but the whole idea about how we spend our time and our day in order to fill whatever void, I guess, yeah, is part of that. There's a narrative in a way you're putting together ourselves just every day when we do things in certain order and think that that creates order out of, out of um, nothing. Sure. Yeah. But the Beckett quote I was going to say was, well, I thought that the most dreadful thing that could happen to anybody would be not to be allowed to sleep so that just as you're dropping off, there'd be a dawn and you'd have to keep awake. You're sinking into the ground alive and it's full of ants and the sun is shining endlessly day and night and there is not a tree. There'd be no shade, nothing. And that bell wakes you up all the time and you've got is a little parcel of things to see you through life. And I thought, who could cope with that and go down singing? only a woman. Now, I'm intrigued by what you've been already saying about this as a woman character, a creature. Why do you think you saw it that way? Do you feel that only a woman would respond in the way Winnie does or in this play? Why do I think Beckett saw it that way? Yeah. Oh, I can't answer for him at all. But I do think that particularly from Happy Days onwards, his female roles are the best roles ever written. I think he was fascinated with women. But what I adore about her, even though she is, as you say, dressing up conventionally every day and going through conventional rituals to get through the day, she has so many voices in her mind, her memory, her uh, uh, stubborn vestiges of poetry, but crucially her imagination, um, which she uses, which Beckett uses. He called it a kind of mental thuggy, which is throttling the dead in his head. Uh, comes up in A. Joe, but these stories 
uh, the Mildred story and the cooker, Mr. Shower story that she tells herself throughout the day. There is my story, of course, when all else fails, as a way of transcending her circumstances. And in a way, that's what Beckett does. He pays homage to the creative imagination. He pays homage to, despite desperate circumstances, our inherent defiance. He celebrates defiance. He, of course, doesn't shy away from our fragility, human weakness, and, and, and the, the frailty of our humanity. But he, he celebrates our chutzpah, our, our creative endeavors, our ability to turn our faces to the light. And that's what I, so I, I disagree with a lot of people who find his, his outlook on life to be very bleak. I think actually, I find him quite a hopeful writer. I think he's very honest and doesn't provide us with any false comforts, narratively or otherwise, but he lays it all out and goes, there it is. These are the circumstances. We are born astride the grave and the wor- the earth is consuming us. And this is... <laughs> this is how we get through the days. This is how we string together a couple of happy days. Yeah, so you said so much to get into there. The, 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 the question of the bleakness versus her indomitable spirit or our spirit to survive somehow seems to be essential here. And the question of the balance of those things in the end, I'm not sure where what we think about how she responds to her circumstance whether we actually pity her or think she's deluded or whether we admire her or all those things, I think. Mm. I was going to ask you about the, just thinking about the, the setup of Happy Days. For those who don't know the play that well, I've, you know, we've introduced the idea that when he is buried in the, in the earth for the extent of the play, and in fact, in the second half of the play, the mound increases so that she's buried up to her neck, so only her head is exposed. And I was going to ask you about acting in those circumstances. You talk about it literally, physically. I mean, to some degree, you must have felt the, the predicament of her of her physical oppression. But also for you as an actor, what, what you're left with in order to communicate, presumably, is your voice and your face and eyes and to some degree limited gestures. You have your arms and hands in the first half of the play. I'm sure you're very aware of how to use what you have to communicate. Yeah, I mean... I guess because of my experience with Beckett, remember my first Beckett role was at the end of a trajectory that he was working towards. And that was not I, where it was just a a pair of disembodied lips on stage. So I toured the world with my head in a harness, my arms in brackets, a blindfold on where I couldn't see, hear or move, touring a monologue for just a pair of disembodied lips. Um, So I'm well kind of used to filling an auditorium with just my voice and my soul and my emotional attachments to each word. And I learned the discipline of that early on, but also my background is a ballet dancer. And he taught me how to infuse everything into music and the music of his work and the force of that, that emotional power driven through these tight restrictions is very potent you know none of the intensity leaks away in the body and the arms and the gestures and because he's so ruthlessly truthful I can attach my own truths to his taught tempo without worrying about being indulgent so actually they can be far more powerful than let's say if I had more scope where the intensity would leak away. So I've always been very grateful for his inverted commas restrictions. I love, I love that form. That's fabulous because actually, it, of course, it's true as I, I now recall and sitting in the audience, we are absolutely riveted to every gesture, flicker of your eye, movement of your arm, because that's what there is, right? We're not distracted in any way. So there is that potency and focus as you've described. Mm. I'm also fascinated by the language, of course, which I'm sure you you know very well and relish. How would you characterize Beckett's language, particularly in this play? I've always felt that Beckett writes a kind of music. It's a poetry, it's a music, it's a his plays are like scores. And 
the rhythms are where all the humor and tragedy lies. And I, I feel like an instrument in that sense, playing his score and musician trying to pay homage to that, to those, so, you know, the silences and pauses are just as important as the, the words. And so I pay very special attention to his um, notations, let's say. I get that completely because I, I was thinking back now to your performance in the play that there's a real rhythm to the language, isn't it? Because there are also numerous repeating phrases, little catchphrases like no, no and great mercies of the old style. Or There are so, so many of them. When I, and when I think of it, I think of you saying those little snippets and the rhythm of those come back to me very powerfully. But I also think he has a, a, a wonderful ear, doesn't he, for vernacular as well, for places. I wondered, I was going to ask you, it seemed to me the language seemed very Irish, that Beckett was recalling potentially and reproducing the rhythms and some of the vernacular of speech that he would have grown up with, with women around him. Did, does that ring true? Would you say that's true? Well, it does to me. However, like anything truthful, there's a universality to it also. So that doesn't exclude American performers or English performers from performing the roles. I recognize Winnie and I recognize some of the language. And as you mentioned, vernacular language, there's a phrase diddies that like just sounds probably most accurate in a Dublin accent, which is why I chose a Dublin accent for the cookers. I chose to give her a sliding accent of affectation where her, and it was the same with my grandmother as she lay dying, when she would recite her school poetry, out would come this very kind of posh English accent. And even like at 99 years of age, this English accent came out when she was reciting Wordsworth, and you know, and she had quite advanced dementia at this point, but these were the stubborn vestiges she remembered, but she also remembered the voice she used to, to speak them. And um, I, I gave that to Winnie because I felt there was a lot of affectation. Yes. And I saw how she would wish to transcend her social circumstances. But there was other more academic, let's say, choices that I made. I discovered, which hasn't really been discussed much before, about the play. And when I spoke to all the academics at Reading and various people, hadn't really considered that Willie, her husband, is British Army and the base Barrow Green is in Seven Oaks and there was a military base there and Becky give us all, gives us all the clues. There's such truth always at the heart of Beckett that if you want to, you don't have to, but if you want to lift up any phrase and investigate it, nothing is there accidentally. He never just puts something there because it's pretty or sounds right or will fill a gap nothing is and uh, not thought through it intensely and so it's a joy as a performer that you go why did he use that word and why has he chosen to for Winnie to misremember that line oh wow because the original line is this and that what you know and why did he use the word brownie for the gun well that was the browning revolver that was given to the British military why has he wanted a battle of Britain moustache why does he suggest spats oh that donates the regiment that he was in the Scottish regiment you know and you really you can surround yourself with great foundation with Beckett but again that's not to say that they need to be replicated as museum pieces there's lots of scope here for interpretation within these seemingly rigid stage directions and I have seen a marvelous Winnie in Diane Reese in America I've seen many English versions of her it's just I had great joy with his Irishness because I guess I'm closer to Beckett's background and I can hear the voices he hears in his head and I enjoy eking them out and casting them with my own family members. Yes, well, that, that's fascinating. And, you, and you're right, there was a uh, interesting you saying about that affectation because there, there is a power, wasn't there, in the contrast between Winnie's tone and style of speech and the base reality of where she is of what she's trapped in the world she's in uh -huh. yeah which brings something about the message about how we 
dress up our world in whatever social niceties in order exactly. to- Exactly. Exactly. Uh, actually, interesting, Beckett described, I was gonna ask you about this, Beckett described her as having a profound frivolity. She's scatterbrained, she babbles. I don't know, is that what she's doing? I think he'd also described her as having a kind of bird-like quality of being of the air. And he's very, Willie, by contrast, is very of the earth, very meat and two veg. And I guess that means that she's kind of trying to transcend her circumstances and slightly is elevated above her circumstances, or is at least drawn in that direction. And she has a kind of flightiness where she arrives at different solutions for a moment and is ever resourceful yes but uh, I think that you know the dressing up her circumstances the attention to her looks to her lipstick to the daily routines to attempting to despite the very fact that she you know she, she is very very aware of her circumstances Despite that, she is desperately trying to greet the day positively and look for the best and find routines and distractions to get her from the bell for waking to the bell for sleep, despite, at least in the first act, of her using the opportunity to end it at any time with the brownie being there. She has the revolver. Yeah, so there's a... There's a pattern as you said to her speech, which is, you know, some of it's sort of just a stream of unedited commentary to some ways, which we all do to fill the time and bankness. But but also, as you say, it's a certain deliberateness to it as well, because she maintains these these um, rituals. It's this sort of discipline to her day. These things tied one over, she says, to stay busy. Well, yeah, I mean, and one of the things for me I found to be the most tragic is clearly you have a fairly well-educated woman. She's extremely intelligent, funny, resourceful, um, bright, sparky. And she's with a bit of a a, a lump, a, a gross thug behind her. And the prayer of wanted, you know, he keeps reading these tidbits from Reynolds News again, which is another thing that tells us where he's from. And... He's reading these tidbits out, but the thing that arrests her each time is wanted bright boy. And that's her prayer. Yes. You know, I think what could have happened if she had met an intellectual equal. And from that point of view, I really feel there's a sensitivity there with Beckett. Some of his greatest um, muses growing up, Ethna, when he was in college in Trinity and Barbara Bray were these wonderfully intellectual women. And Suzanne, of course, was responsible for his, entirely responsible for getting his work published. You know, when so often, up until fairly recently, women were just, you know, encouraged to look at their looks and uh, maintain a house and not, you know, see themselves as intellectual equals. And we all know that Anyway, I won't even go into that. But I think that is also the kind of the tragedy of Winnie. I was going to ask you, it's fascinating about that relationship with Willie then. Mm. You've said some really interesting things there about Winnie, because as you say, the well-educated, initially you would think that's not the case. I mean, you know, because of her looks perhaps, and you fall for that cliche of her looks. But she quote, she has literary quotations, references throughout the play that indicate she's relatively well-read as well, as you said, well-educated. But what is the relationship with Willie? How happy were they? How disappointed is she? What does she think of him? What do you read into what, what that's all about? Again, I'm not going to prescribe that for the audience because it's so funny when people come, they see different things in their relationship. You know, people would say that's just a perfectly dysfunctional, happy marriage. <laughs> Others would recognize how she's starving for an intellectual evil equal I mean and certainly that's something that struck me a lot throughout it has been quite sad people make compromises in life and they're consumed by them so I you know I I wouldn't want to prescribe that to an audience member I have my own let's say attachments to certain interpretations but they changed often 
And uh, I think there was a romantic at heart, but there are other clues that are in the play, you know, when she's remembering someone saying, Winnie, what is the alternative? What is the alternative? As if, as you know, she had to make a choice at a certain point and just to have to turn around to your partner at any time and ask and certainly not be provided with the dignity of an answer. Was I lovable once? Was I ever lovable? Yes. It was heartbreaking. He very rarely responds in a way that gives her anything back, obviously, in the play at all. And of course, there's suggestions that he rarely talked throughout their entire lives, whatever that consisted of, that she's therefore been disappointed. And that the day when he came whining for her hand, saying he worshipped her, there is some suggestion that there might have been a potential for some romantic attachment. Oh, of course, you know, and she she she's been dining out on that every day since, you know, that day, the pink fizz, the flute glasses, the last guest gone. And um, that romantic moment when he proposed and <laughs> and then nothing. And then nothing. Exactly. From that day forth. Yeah, exactly. So I'm intrigued that when he finally does appear in the play in the sense of crawls around because he's incapable of standing and can only crawl in and out of his hole behind her. Well, we don't know, is he capable? No, well, fair point. I'm, I love the way you keep everything open, nothing prescribed. He doesn't, let's just say he doesn't stand during the course of the play and he crawls around to the front at the end and, and is struggling to climb up the, the mound towards her. Mm. And I, again, you're not going to answer this question, are you, Lisa? Because I'm going to say, what does he want? What is he seeking to do when he approaches her like that, struggling? Well, also, we don't know if he's really there or not. Uh, we don't know, is she there or not? We don't know who is a figment of whose imagination or not. You know, that's all open to for interpretation. You're making it even more difficult to ask the straight question then. If we don't even know that, but just assume that he's there for the moment. Well, well, I don't. I'm trying not to make it difficult. But what I what I'm trying to do is not shut out other people's more nuanced interpretations. Yeah. Just because my interpretation is one thing, you know, one could see it as him dressed in funeral attire. This could be her swan song, her dying song. Who knows? You know, there's multiple interpretations. And if I give you one and an audience member listens to that, then, you know, I'm shutting out the possibilities of others. And yes, this is the beautiful space that Beckett has given us where we're all allowed a space to see it as we we want to see it or need to see it are predisposed to seeing it, whichever. But I, I don't believe in inventing interpretations when they're really, it is not there in the script. So it's open. It is open. Yes. As you say, I, in fact, Beckett said that it was deliberately ambiguous, I believe, and that he didn't know. And that's the point. And there are suggestions in all sorts of directions, which makes it so rich as to what the possibilities could be and that leaves it open and all those possibilities resonating. I mean, this is what we're getting into the heart of what Beckett is, you know, uh, when you watch any program or listen to a story. Uh, so if you want to kind of add a little story here into Happy Days, that is not uh. by all means, knock yourself out. But what Beckett has done is left the door open for everyone to come with their own stories. Yeah. And to see themselves in this situation, be it Willie or, or Winnie. Yes, because, OK, so you one of the stories could be that Willie has been listening to Winnie rat, prattle on for years and he can't bear it. And he's just going to crawl up there and grab the brownie and finish it all. Or, and then was Winnie, but Winnie is, is she romantically interested? She says, it's an unexpected pleasure. Oh, I say, this is terrific. When he appears, it could be completely ironic. And I had a sense perhaps that it was. And that when he's trying to reach her for a kiss or what we don't know, actually, she's relatively dismissive of him. So, you know, there's all sorts of ways you could look at, it. as you say, perhaps we bring our predispositions to it. Oh, yeah. And I, I've seen that you've brought your own because what you're ignoring is that he's reaching for the revolver. Yeah. And what she's using in her defense in that moment, which is all she has is her voice, is suggesting that she could have given him a hand and reminded him that she always gave him a hand, that he was always in need of a hand. And then in a way, she emasculates him again, and he can't even reach for the revolver. 
And so she was always, you know, she uses her intellect to uh, trump him in that moment um, to survive. I wasn't discounting. I was not discounting the possibility that he was reaching out for the gun lying on the ground. No, but uh, what, what, it, no, what is interesting, though, when you attach your own narrative is I, I see a very male drive in interpretation there, which is interesting. You know, I came out of the theater one of the days and this gentleman said, you know, I hated you in the first act and I wanted him to kill her. No, oh, come on. And then in the second act, I felt sorry for you. And <laughs> to which I replied, I don't think she would have liked you either. <laughs> <laughs> no. But, you know, it, it's, it is the prattling away. And often men do have difficulty hearing a two hour monologue from a woman. I mean, we've had to endure the reverse for centuries. I hasten to add that this is not my specific interpretation. I'm just suggesting it's one of those. No, but, but it, yeah. And I get where you're coming from. I love listening to you. I was going to ask you, you mentioned earlier about the language, about the humor. It is funny at times, isn't it? I mean, you know, some people would say, what? Are you kidding? But I'm sure I would say so, and you would say so. Where does the humor come from? Oh, she's hysterical throughout. And I think Beckett tickles a very, or demonstrates a very immediate truth within all of us. I think the hilarity of our situation is something he explores all the time in his work I think he had a, a rich appetite for humor in fact I would say nearly all of the first act is comedy and there's still quite a lot of it in the second act her humor is just gorgeous and the dynamic between the two is very funny a lot of that it comes through again the rhythm and the and the timing Yes, it's the, in the language and also the, the reveling in the language as well. There's a humor in the inappropriateness or the very specific word he uses or she uses that just lifts it. I was going to say, you were saying about the second act. The second act is, is very hard to watch, however, in lots of ways. You were, your head was above the sand, was bathed in a stark white light and makeup and you know skull-like. And it, it, there was a sort of weariness and a sense that you, you cannot survive much longer and of course, the earth is literally engulfing you. And we've talked earlier about how much do you think Winnie is aware of the hopelessness of our situation? Because Beckett said somewhere, and he may have been deliberately provocative, that she's not stoic, she's unaware. I found that hard to credit. What did you think? I think I don't know, actually. I don't know. Um, and I don't even know where I put my mind with that because she's so busy. Yeah. Keeping on, keeping on that she's certainly not sentimental about her situation. To say that she's not aware of it is simply not true. It's in the text, when I have my legs and the use of my legs, when I was not yet stuck in this way. So she's referring to her situation. But then she makes the comparison, is anyone any better off? Is tomorrow better than today? Am I worse off than yesterday? Probably not. She also preempts the future. And should one day the earth cover my breast, which it does, what she might do and how she might prepare herself. Well, then I've never seen my breast. Just pretend I've never seen it. She's also aware that time is moving increasingly on. Not long now, Winnie, not long now until the bell, you know, and perhaps it's time for my song. And she's wondering, do, does she sing her swan song now? So she's very aware of time and the play, if anything, is a meditation on time among many things. But I think there's a vehement denial for self-pity. And I think there is a constant urge to turn her face to the light. Yeah. She has recognized significantly in the second act that prayer is no longer work. Yeah. And, and what she is left with is her song. I just wonder whether, I mean, it could go on at such length about time, for example, that it's very hard to decipher literally what's happening with time. There's some mm -hmm. suggestions that, that she thinks time is repeating itself, that things she puts in the bag mm -hmm. will come out in the same way they did yesterday, that the parasol that burned will burn again or has already burned in the past. Mm -hmm. We don't know what's happening in conventional time terms. How long has she been there? Mm -hmm. But you're right. There is that sense, she says, that it's running out. And you could see mm -hmm. that's literally the truth in terms of her being buried, I guess, and the, and the, and the weakness in her mm -hmm. and, and her doubts about religion. She prays in the very beginning of the play and, and at the end of the first act, I think. But then it, in the second act has given up on that, saying that she doesn't believe that anymore, I guess. 
setting that aside, I was interested in how heroic do you think she is? Is she, because there's a question of whether when Beckett says she's unaware, she's not stoic, is she just oblivious? And therefore we should be pitying her lack of recognition or? Well, I think I've demonstrated in the text that she's not oblivious. I've just given you maybe seven examples. So I've answered that part of the question. Yes. Is she heroic? Are any of us heroic? What does it take for any of us to get up out of bed every day? I'm sure we all have felt buried up to our necks. What Beckett is celebrating is human defiance. And so, you know, there's nothing supernatural about her. She she distracts herself with a bit of frivolity, yes. Yes. As we all do. And, and this is what gets us through. We cannot look down the barrel of life the way it is and realize from the minute we're born, we're dying. And, and none of us know when that day will be and that there is no God. And if we were to remind ourselves and look down the barrel of that every day, it would be very difficult, even though we all know that truth is there, our potential truth. But we distract ourselves in the meantime. So I don't think there's anything significantly frivolous about that. I think it's a deeply human preoccupation that both men and women in particular. But when our backs are particularly against the wall, we sometimes cling to that with more fervor, I guess. And I think Beckett has Winnie walk that tightrope of knowing what is there. She's definitely, I've just given you the examples of how aware she is of her circumstances in the text. And yet how she is, as I keep saying, turning her, her face towards the light or her poetry or her routines or the bag or coming up with games to get her through the day. And, you know, if you look at what in particular, what we've all been through these past 18 months where uh, we haven't been able to indulge in as much frivolity and sociability and distractions as we, as we would normally, just how hard that has been. Yes. And so I think that's why it's the perfect play for now in the sense that it's prepped the audience for a kind of truth that we thought we'd never have to face. Yes. I think you're right though, about this balance is extraordinary the way he is able to draw our attention to the profound existential questions that we all have and fear at times and succumb to even, but don't and don't have answers for, but distract ourselves from. And sometimes he su- does he suggest that our distractions are facile? Of course they are. They're never going to answer this ultimate questions for us. But actually, we have a little other choice. And somewhere in there, also admiring the urge or energy or uh, ability to continue to keep on keeping on, as you said, as opposed to scorning it, I think. It's um, something that ultimately he grants, as, as you say, as human. I think she says at one stage, there's, you know, in recognizing that there's not much else you can do, there's so little one can do. One does it all. All one can is only human, human nature, human weakness. So it is a weakness, perhaps, but it's what we what we do. And as you just said, the vision of a world overcome by collective disaster, whether it's an environmental or other form of catastrophe or whatever, doesn't seem that far away to us now, does it? And it and it it challenges us. You know, that's kind of a desolation challenges us to the extreme limit. I don't know whether you, we'd ever be anything equal to what Winnie, but what does it demonstrate? How bleak our future is, or that we take heart from her indomitable spirit somehow, her will to survive, to make the best of it. It's both, I guess, is it? Yeah. I, um, look, I find her a deeply inspiring human character. And I think like all of Beckett's characters, he celebrates human defiance in the face of frailty and loneliness. And um, I find her endlessly fascinating and resourceful and the ultimate survivor. It's what's so wonderful is she says at some point, that's what's so wonderful, the way man adapts, but it could be woman, of course, the way woman adapts, we adapt, and how we adapt even in the theater to that what we're seeing somehow and accept what we're seeing, I think is part of it. Lisa, that's been fantastic. Thank you. You're so wise about this play. And uh, I love talking to you. Thank you for spending time with you today and for your wonderful Winnie, which will live in my memory for a very long time. And best of luck and joy on the forthcoming birth of your child. Thanks so much, Douglas. As the curtain falls on Winnie and the inexorable rise of the trap that will ultimately overwhelm her, how do we feel about the desolation we witness and her vain attempts to make the best of her pitiful predicament? Do we despair 
at the emptiness of her existence, and by implication, perhaps our own? Do we scorn her shallowness, her delusion that her empty prayers and determined optimism can defy the reality of her life? Or do we finally recognize and admire her courage to carry on, and as she says, do it all, all one can, tis only human. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Thanks for listening. To listen to other episodes, to find out news about future episodes, or to leave comments about what you've heard, please visit us at www.theplaypodcast.com. You can also follow us on Facebook or on Twitter at The Play Pod. You're also welcome to email plays at theplaypodcast.com to suggest plays that we could talk about in future episodes. You can also register your suggestion on the website. Thanks again and see you next time.